Hi everyone, hope you all must be doing great. In the last lecture, we were doing PGVP revision and we have already completed that deductions part. From starting from section 30 till 37, that deduction which are allowed from PGVP. In fact, we have already completed section 38 also. It was a small section that if there is any expense which is taking place for business purpose also and for other non-business purpose also, we will be allowing only proportionate deduction which is related to business. Do you remember that? If you look at your uh, index, then we have already covered section 28 charging, section 29 is computation. From section 30 to 37, in fact 38 is also done, these are the deductions allowed. Remember section 30 related to building, 31 plant and machinery, furniture, your repairs and insurance expenses. 32 is depreciation, 35 is scientific research, outside research not allowed in a default scheme. In-house research is allowed in, under both the schemes. 35 AD specified business only for optional regime, not under default regime. 35 D preliminary expenses and VRS expenses, one fifth. 36 is other deductions, bonus, commission, health insurance premium should not be paid in cash, bed debts employer contribution to approved funds or statutory funds, unrecognized fund is not allowed, right? Uh, if there is any bad debts and if there is any recovery of bad debts that we will see in section 41, recovery of bad debts is our income. And if there is any provision for bad debts, please don't allow any provision, right? Section 37 is general deduction. If any of the expenses not covered under section 30 to 36, and it is a business expense, it is not personal, it is a capital, it is not capital expenditure, it is revenue expenses and it is not prohibited by law, then you can allow that expense under section 37. Do you remember all that? Okay, so now again an important portion, deductions not allowed and these four sections are very very important. They always, uh, PGVP is, you understand it's an important chapter and there are some sections which are of utmost importance. So these are some of the sections which are very important from examination point of view. You should know about these sections. These sections relate to deductions which are not allowed under PGPP. See, first section 40 small a says, it has some list of five or six expenses. Uh, one of the important one is that if you are paying amount, let's say interest, royalty or fees for technical services outside India, and you are not deducting TDS or you are not depositing TDS, then we are not going to allow it. Second thing is that if you are paying the amount to uh, a resident or if it is within India and if TDS provisions are applicable on that particular amount which you are paying and you have not deducted TDS or if you have deducted but not deposited up to the due date of ROI, then 30% will, will not be allowed. Do you remember all these port portion? So we will be revising this part. 40A2, if you are making any payment to your related party, so who would be the related party for individual who are related party for HUA or for AOP, BOI or for partnership firm or company who are the related party, we have to see this. So if you are making a payment to a related party and if it is in excess of fair market value, so to the extent it exceeds the fair market value, that is not allowed under 40A2, we will discuss that. 40A3, 40A3 is that if you are making a payment of more than 10,000 rupees in a single day to a single party, it is not allowed. And for transporters, 35,000 limit is there. And also we will see exceptions to this particular section that there are certain cases, there are certain circumstances where you can make the payment of more than this limit also. 43B, a very important section. We have already discussed some part of it. It contains a list of expenses, some six or seven expenses are there, which are allowed only when they are actually paid, which are allowed only when they are actually paid up to the due date of ROI. And please remember this time, it, this section becomes more important because there is a small amendment also in this section. I'll tell you what is the amendment. So let's discuss this, these uh, four sections today. Then there are some other miscellaneous sections, which we can discuss in our next lecture. Okay, section 40A. So if you come to your book, this is page number 5.15. You must have already downloaded the book from the website. It is available in the description. Section 40 small a. 
it has some list of expenses which are not allowed so i'll uh, discuss each one by one so first is written over here if you'll come to the next page second point is written over here third fourth fifth sixth so it has certain list of expenses which are not allowed under pgpp very important section both practically as well as from the examination point of view this is one of the examiner's favorite section okay section 40 small a says first point says that if you are paying any amount outside india if you are paying any amount it can include specifically it says about interest royalty and fees for technical services if you are paying outside india or any other taxable amount also not only these three but any other amount which you are paying outside india or to a non-resident and that is a taxable amount for that particular person if we are paying it you understand if one party pays another party receives so it becomes income of another party so if we are paying outside india the party who is sitting outside india or if we are paying to a non-resident both are covered over here so that party is getting income and if that income is taxable in india then that party should pay tax in india also right because that income is taxable in india so now what income tax did is income tax has given some responsibility to the payer the one the person who is paying this amount that we call as, as tds deductor so we are giving responsibility to this person that whenever you will pay this amount you are paying interest royalty or fees for technical services or even any other amount that is taxable if you are paying to a non-resident you have two responsibilities you have two major responsibilities one responsibility is that you have to deduct the TDS. These two conditions are very important. Please remember this. First of all, first condition says that you have to deduct the TDS when during the previous year. It should be deducted during the previous year. Here, previous year, we understand our previous year is previous year 23 24 for our 2024 examinations. So you have to, if you are paying interest, if you are paying royalty, if you are paying fees for technical services that we call FTS or any other amount that is chargeable to tax, if you are paying outside India or to a non-resident, right? So you have two responsibilities. First of all, deduct TDS in this year. In this year, TDS should be deducted. So this year means please deduct TDS up to 31st March 2024. This is the last day of the year. Please deduct up to this date. After deducting, go and deposit. You don't have to go anywhere, but you have you can deposit it online. But yes, you have to, after deduction, you have to deposit this TDS also. Just deduction will not do. You have to also deposit this TDS up to which date? Up to the due date of ROI. Whose due date of ROI? The person who is making the payment. Let's say Mr. Ram is sitting in India and he's making a payment to US. So, Mr. Ram's responsibility is to deduct and Mr. Ram has to deduct, deposit this also TDS up to due date of Ram's, uh, it's Ram's due date, right? So, up to the due date of ROI. Whose due date of ROI? Ram's due date. The person who is sitting outside India, that person's due date? No, Ram, the, the person who is paying the amount, the person who is a tax deductor, that is Ram. So, if you are paying outside India or to a non-resident, on which TDS should be deducted. You should deduct the TDS on this income and if TDS provisions are there and if you have not deducted or not de deducted during the previous year or even not deposited, then we will be disallowing that expense. How much expense we will be disallowing it? 100%. 100% we will not be allowing it. So if I give you the example, let's say Ram is sitting in India. Let's say Ram is sitting in Chennai. And in his PL account, he is running some business. And in his PL account, he has to pay interest, or he has to pay royalty, or he has to pay fees for technical services, or even any other amount which is chargeable to tax. And to whom he is paying? He is paying to, let's say, he is paying to Paul, and Paul is sitting in US. So it is Ram's responsibility that whatever amount he is paying, he should deduct the TDS amount also on that amount, right? When it should be deducted in previous year 23, 24, it is to be deducted. Plus, it should be deposited also. It should be deposited also up to the due date of ROI. Due date of ROI. Whose due date? Ram's due date. 
राइट सो इफ राम्स ड्यू डेट इज थर्टी फर्स्ट जुलाई और इट इज थर्टी फर्स्ट अक्टूबर और इन सम केसेस थर्टी एथ नवंबर ऑल दर्टी एथ नवंबर इज नॉट दैट रेलिवेंट फॉर सी इंटरमीडिएट स्टूडेंट्स वी विल सी दैट एन सी ए फाइनल सो इट शुड बी डिपॉजिटेड ऑल्सो अप टू दिस ड्यू डेट लेट से दिस अमाउंट वॉज लेट से दिस अमाउंट वॉज टू लाख रुपीज सो इफ टी डी एस इज रिक्वायर टू बी डिडक्टेड and if both the conditions are satisfied both the conditions must be satisfied if both the conditions are satisfied we will going to allow this expense we are going to allow this expense if any of the condition doesn't get satisfied let's say we have deducted during the previous year but we have not deposited second condition is not fulfilled we will not be allowing it we will disallow this expense entirely 100% we will be disallowing it let's say we have deposited up to the due date of roi but we have deducted it late this condition was not satisfied because we have to deduct in the previous year itself i have already told you up to let's say for our year previous year is 23 24 up to 31st march 2024 you should deduct it if this condition is not satisfied you have deducted it late then in this case also in this year it will be disallowed it will be disallowed that is both the conditions simultaneously should be satisfied if any of the condition is not fulfilled please disallow it then can it be allowed in any other subsequent year the answer is yes if it is disallowed in this year you can allow this expense in the year when it is actually deposited when the tds is actually deposited you can allow this amount right so this is an important section 40 small a this is the first point it says that if you are paying interest royalty fees for technical service outside india please deduct the tds during the previous year deposit the tds up to the due date of roi and if any of the condition is not satisfied we will going to disallow this expense very important and it ex expense we will disallow it this year it can be allowed in any subsequent year whenever this tds is deposited and here it is a uh, should i give you one more example okay let's see let's uh, see this example also let's say it's a pnl account of x limited and x limited is sitting in india x limited has a business in india and in this previous year they have a due date of 31st october 2024 this is the previous year 23 24 and this is the due date got it okay they are paying interest payable outside india they are paying 5 lakh rupees outside india so what is the responsibility of x limited sir their responsibility is that they should deduct up to 31st march 24 they should deduct up to 31st march 24 and they should deposit up to the due date of roi if both the conditions are satisfied we are going to allow it otherwise we will disallow it so let's see when tds was deducted tds was deducted on 31st march 24 okay first condition is satisfied it is deposited on 15 december 24 sorry sir it is not deposited up to this date so this amount will be disallowed this year this amount will be disallowed in this year we will not allow 5 lakh rupees so what uh, implication will it make whenever uh, we are computing our pgbp it will be added back because we are disallowing this expenses right you some students can say sir interest is allowed under section 36 why we are disallowing it because section 40 small a is overriding those sections 40 small a will override th that section it will start with not withstanding anything written in those sections if this conditions are not satisfied we are going to disallow it okay let me take a second example if they are paying royalty outside india they are paying to a non resident how much 3 lakh rupees two responsibilities deduct during the previous year deposit up to roi due date let's see both the conditions are satisfied or not tds is deducted and deposited on 15th april 2024 no it is after this previous year this previous year last date was 31st march 24 so here tds is deducted late first condition is not satisfied although it is deposited i understand it is deposited before the due date of roi on or before the due date of roi but first condition is not satisfied we are not going to allow it we are not going to allow it then in this year please understand in this year in previous year 23 24 it will not be allowed then can it be allowed later the answer is yes it can be allowed later whenever you the taxes deposited we will allow it so tax was deposited in on which date 15th april 2024 now don't don't look any due date right just look at this that what is this date 15th april 2024 it is falling in which year it is falling in previous year 24 25 so we can allow this expense in this year 
whenever the TDS is deposited, the date on which the TDS is deposited. Just tell me in which previous year that, day, that date is falling. So that date is a part of this previous year. So 3 lakh for this year, it will be disallowed. But yes, in this case, we can allow it in previous year 24-25, right? Let's say third example is fees for technical services. How much? 4 lakh rupees. Let's see, TDS is deducted on 31st March 24. Okay, 31st March 24 is okay with us. This is up to the previous year. And deposited on 15th October 2024. 15th October 2024, on or before 31st October. Yes, second condition is also satisfied. Both the conditions are satisfied. We have no issues. We will allow this 4 lakh. There is no problem. We will allow this 4, 4 lakh, but this 5 and this 3 will not be allowed. Right. So we will be allowed this, be aligned this 4 lakh in this year itself because both the condition is satisfied. Right. One important thing. One important thing. Let's say X limited fails to deduct TDS. X limited fails to deduct TDS. Okay. I'll explain with this example. Let's say it is responsibility of Ram. Let me take the, that earlier example. Right. So let's say it's Ram's responsibility that they are supposed to deduct TDS. And if it'll, they, they will not deduct TDS or not deposit TDS, we will be disallowing for Ram. But let's say he is paying, Ram is paying this amount to Paul. But this Paul is a very sincere person. He's a very sincere guy. And he, he files his ROI. He files his, he files his ROI in India, where he mentions the income also, which he has received. He is in his ROI, he mentions the income also. He shows that income also, which he, is, he has received from Ram. And he has also, and because Paul is a very sincere guy, he has also already paid the tax also. He has already paid the tax also. So what does government want? Please look at it from government point of view. Government needs tax on this amount, right? So initially, first they have given this responsibility to Ram. Please Ram, whenever you will be paying this amount, deduct the TDS. Let's say Ram has not deducted TDS, but Paul has deposited his income tax. Paul has deposited this income tax. He has mentioned this income which he is receiving from Ram. He has mentioned this in his ROI and he is depositing his ROI also and he has paid the tax also on this income. So government needs tax. It has been received by the government. So it will allow, it will say, okay, Ram, although you have not deducted the TDS, but the person to whom you have paid, Paul, is a sincere person. He has uh, paid his tax also and he has filed his ROI also. So the date on which Paul will file his ROI, the date on which Paul will file his ROI, we will assume that the TDS has been deposited. I'm again repeating. Let's say Ram has not fulfilled his obligations. But on the other hand, the person to whom the amount is paid, any interest, royalty or fees for technical services, who is the receiver, in our case, it is Paul. Paul has fulfilled his obligation. He has filed his ROI. He has shown that income also, which he is receiving from Ram. He has paid the tax on it. So the date on which this return will be filed, it will be assumed that Ram has, it will be assumed that TDS has been deposited. Although TDS is not deposited, but Paul has paid the income tax. So we will be allowing that amount for Ram also in that year in which this ROI is filed, right? So this can come in your MCQ, not very important for descriptive, but yes, in MCQ it can come. So if the deductor fails to deduct and deposit TDS, if the deductor fails, Ram has failed to deduct or deposit TDS. However, the receiver, in our case, the receiver was Mr. Paul files his ROI and pays tax on such income, then it is assumed that TDS has been deposited. It will be assumed as if the TDS has been deposited on the date of filing the return and therefore deduction is allowed when ROI is filed. At the, the time when ROI is filed, deduction will be allowed for RAM also. We will not disallow it, we, will, we can allow it, right? So this was important. One important point over here, here we are paying interest, royalty, fees for technical services or any other sum. But this, please uh, pay attention on this point. Let's say if we are paying salary outside India, if we are paying salary outside India, right? In this case, let's say Ram is paying salary to Paul. 
So on this salary, it is Ram's obligation, same obligation that Ram's, Ram has to deduct TDS up to the previous year, that is during the previous year, he has to deduct TDS and he should deposit it also up to the due date of ROI. If Ram is paying salary outside India, then it is the responsibility of Ram to deduct TDS and deposit TDS also. If both the conditions are satisfied, let's say he has deducted during the previous year, also deposited up to the due date of ROI, TDS on what amount? Salary, I'm saying salary outside India, right? Then that salary expense for Ram will be allowed. We have no issues with that. But if it is not deducted during the previous year, okay? or deducted but not deposited, that is one of the condition or both the condition is not fulfilled, then we will disallow that salary. We will disallow that salary, right? So same, it is same thing, but the difference is here. If TDS is deposited late, then also on that salary will not be allowed. It will be disallowed. It will remain disallowed always. It will never be allowed. So one of the difference over here is we, this, both the points are covered under section 40 small a. So first point says in, if you are paying interest, royalty, FTS or any other amount except salary, except salary if you are paying outside India and you should deduct TDS, deposit TDS. Both the conditions satisfied, you can allow in this year. And don't worry, if it is disallowed in this year, then whenever your tax has been deposited, it will be allowed in that year. But salary says about salary, even if TDS has been deposited late, salary will never be allowed. So we can say, in sim simple words, I can say, for salary, we have to satisfy both the condition here itself. If these conditions are satisfied, salary will be allowed. And if this condition is not satisfied, it will always remain disallowed. Even if the person is depositing TDS after some time, but it once it is disallowed, it will always be disallowed, right? So this point was point number three here. If you come to next page, the four, uh, sorry, not, not three, it's four. I'm so sorry, it's four. Any salary paid outside India, any salary paid outside India to a non-resident, and if no TDS is deducted during the previous year or TDS is not deposited up to the due date of ROI, we will disallow it, we will disallow it. Important point is that even if TDS is deposited after the due date of ROI, deduction will not be allowed. If it would have been interest, if it would have been royalty, fees for technical services or any other sum except salary, we would have allowed in the year when TDS is deposited. But for salary, please don't allow. Right? Easy? Okay. Come to second point. If you are paying any amount to resident within India, so first point and fourth point was related to outside India or to a non-resident. But we also understand, uh, I believe that although I have not uh, yet then revision of TDS as of now, I will do it later. So after once we finish these heads, we'll come to deductions, clubbing, set off, then I'll start with TDS revision also. But I believe that you have a rough idea about TDS. We have, we have some of the sections in TDS. Let's say, uh, you can just recall any of the section. Let's say 194C is payment to contractor or 194I is a payment. Do you remember these sections? Uh, even if uh, you don't remember it by number, but you know that if you are paying to a contractor and if it is more than the threshold limit, you have to deduct TDS also, right? If he's sitting in India also, yes. If TDS provisions are applicable, you have to deduct TDS, right? If your uh, person is paying any con uh, payment to contractor or to rent or infant factor 194J, professional services, technical services, if they are paying and if TDS provisions are applicable, then you have to deduct TDS also. Let's say there is a company ABC Limited and we understand for company TDS provisions are applicable. If ABC Limited, let's say is paying any rent to Mohan, they are paying rent to Mohan, let's say of rupees uh, 6 lakh, they are paying rent to Mohan. So it is more than the th threshold limit, these threshold limit and all I'll be discussing with you in the TDS chapter. So ABC limited is paying rupees 6 lakh to Mohan. So TDS provisions are there. We understand there is section 194I, which says that if you are paying rent and here 
you are a company tds provisions are applicable to it it is more than the threshold limit also so you have to deduct tds you have to deduct tds right but let's say abc limited is paying is paying to whom outside india non resident or within india it is within india right we have already discussed it about outside india in our first point and our fourth point now i am discussing it if you are making payment within india on which tds provision is applicable on which tds says that you should deduct tds so it is abc's limited responsibility it is assessi here is abc limited so it is abc's limited res, uh, responsibility that they should comply with 194i 194i says that you should deduct tds section 40 small a here says if assessi you are making any payment assessi you are making any payment within india or to a no, or to a resident within india or to a resident that is if it would have been non resident it will already covered in point number 1 or point number 4 here it is point number 2 it says that if you are making payment to a resident or within india on which tds provisions are applicable please remember these words please pay attention on these words on which tds provisions is applicable then it is your responsibility deductor the person who is paying it is your responsibility that tds should be deducted during the previous year please deduct tds during the previous year itself and plus just not only deduct and also deposit it also same date up to the due date of roi up to the due date of roi it is your responsibility if both these conditions are satisfied we are going to allow the 6 lakh we are going to allow the 6 lakh but if any of the condition is not fulfilled let's say first is not fulfilled or second is not fulfilled same treatment then we will be disallowing how much 30% if it was a case of outside india we will disallow 100% but if it is within india or to a resident we will be disallowing 30% out of it 70% we will allow sorry 70% we will allow but 30% we will disallow right so how much would be disallowed out of 6 lakh into 30% that is 1.8 lakh will be disallowed 1.8 lakh will be disallowed but yes we can allow it whenever the in the year whenever the tds has been deposited by you we will allow it but in this year if both the condition are satisfied we will allow 6 lakh rupees but if any of the condition is not satisfied then we will disallow 30% if it would have been outside india we would disallow 100% but if it is within india or to a resident then it will be 30% only right let's say there is another assessor i'll give you another example examiner can ask you see there is mr a mr a is an individual mr a is an individual and he has a business mr a has a business let's say he is paying professional fees he is paying professional fees to someone to his chartered accountant let's say he is paying of rupees 50000 we understand in tds chapter there is a section 194j it tells us that if you are paying fees of more than 30000 rupees the threshold limit is 30000 over there if you are paying more than 30000 rupees uh, to a professional then you are supposed to uh, comply with 194j provision you have to deduct tds at the rate of 10% right that we will see in the tds revision lecture also okay so he is paying amount to a professional okay so he is paying amount to a chartered accountant where he is supposed to deduct tds under 194j we understand individual can individual can also is are supposed to deduct tds the answer is yes if their turnover of the preceding year if their turnover of the preceding year is more than 1 crore rupees we understand they are also obliged to deduct tds they are under an obligation to deduct tds so it depends for individual huf we understand it depends upon the turnover of the last year the preceding year right if this previous year is i'm talking about 23 24 this is the penal account of 23 24 so whether mr a is supposed to deduct tds it depends upon the turnover of the last year the last year is previous year 22 23 so it depends upon the turnover of this year if it is up to 1 crore then they are not supposed to deduct tds but if it is more than 1 crore they are required to deduct tds right so this all we will cover in tds chapter so please tell me let's say his turnover of last year was 5 crore his turnover of last year was 5 crore it means that his turnover was more he is required to deduct tds so if he is required to deduct tds 
40 small a 40 small says a says if you are making any payment if you are making any payment within india or to a resident you are making any payment and on which tds provisions are applicable on which tds provisions are applicable tell me here tds provisions are applicable the answer is yes sir is it applicable to individual the answer is yes if their turnover of the last year is more than 1 crore here the turnover was more than 1 crore so tds provisions were applicable then 40 small a will say you should deduct tds during the previous year and plus you should deposit also up to the due date of ry if both the conditions are satisfied we are happy we will be allowing this 50000 rupees if any of the condition is not fulfilled then we will disallow it it to the extent of 30 percent so 50000 into 30 percent that is 15000 so 15000 we will disallow 35,000, 70 percent we can allow, but 15,000 we can disallow. But yes, we will be allowing this 15,000 also, which we have disallowed in this previous year, in any of the year when whenever this TDS has been deposited, right? But examiner will ask you. Examiner can give you a scenario. He will say that Mr. A during previous year 23, 24 is making a payment of 50,000 to his chartered accountant. That is the professional fees. Okay. And this year turnover is 4 crore. This year turnover is 4 crore. We don't have to see this year turnover. We have to see last year turnover, right? And last year turnover was 99 lakh. So it was not more than 1 crore. Please tell me, are the provisions of 194J will be attracted or not? The answer is no. Because in 194J, it is written that if individual or HUF are only supposed to deduct TDS, it depends upon the turnover of the preceding year, last year, not this year. Examiner will confuse you. Please don't get trapped here, right? Examiner will confuse you. This year, you don't have to, you have to ignore this year turnover. You have to see last year turnover to determine whether this person has to follow TDS provisions or not. So in that case, last year turnover was not more than one crore. So in this case, it was 99 lakh. So, if he has paid without deducting TDS also, we are fine with it. Because why? Because TDS provisions is not applicable. So, we are fine with it. Because 40 small a says if TDS provision is applicable. But in this case, TDS provision is not applicable. Please don't disallow anything in that case. Examiner might confuse you. They will say that uh, he has paid this, he has made this payment without deducting TDS. And this year turnover was 4 crore. So what will student do? They will simply go and they will disallow 30%. They will say, sir, we remember that 30% provision. And now let, let us disallow it 30%. But please also check whether last year turnover is also mentioned or not. If it is mentioned in your question that last year turnover is not up to 1 crore, it was, it was sorry, up to 1 crore, it is okay. But if it is more than 1 crore, then only TDS provisions will apply. So if it is 99 lakh or up to just 1 crore, not more than 1 crore, then in that case, TDS provisions will not apply. And so 40 small a will also not disallow anything. 40 small a will also not disallow anything. So in this case, if last year turnover is not more than 1 crore, even if you have not deducted TDS, it is okay. 194J will also not be attracted. 40 small a will also not be attracted. Please do not disallow anything. Are you all getting this? Now you can ask me, sir, what if, if last year turnover is not mentioned, then we will assume that it is more than 1 crore. Then we will assume that it is more than 1 crore. TDS provisions are attracted, right? But yes, if it is mentioned and specifically mentioned in the question that last year turnover was not more than 1 crore, then please, 194J, please do not bring that into picture. Also, please don't bring 40 small a into picture. Nothing will be disallowed in that case because 40 small a will only come into picture if TDS provisions are applicable. Got it? So this was second point. Any amount payable to a resident on which TDS is required to be deducted. You are paying to a resident on which TDS is required to be deducted. TDS should be de deducted during the previous year, deposited up to the due date of ROI. Both the conditions are satisfied. We are okay. We are happy. But if any of the condition is not satisfied, we will disallow it 30%. But please remember, you have to bring 40 small into picture only if TDS provisions are applicable. And 30% uh, will be disallowed, right? Can we allow it later? The answer is yes, we can allow it later. 
whenever the TDS is deposited, we will allow it. Only the exception is salary. Only the exception is salary and that salary which is paid outside India, right? That salary which is paid to non-resident, only about that you can not allow it in any subsequent year, right? It is only related to salary that to outside India or to a non-resident. Got it? And yes, this provision is same. Let's say we have, uh, let's say, uh, Mr. A, Mr. A was supposed to, his last year turnover was more than 1 crore and he was supposed to deduct TDS, but he has not deducted or not deposited. But this chartered accountant, the person who is receiving it, he has duly filled his ROI. He has also mentioned the income which he is receiving in his ROI and he has paid his tax also. So on the date when this person, the receiver has filed his ROI, we will assume that the TDS is deposited and we will allow for this person also. Okay, same concept. Okay. Third point says what we are doing, we are doing a very important section 40 small a. So 40 small a uh, has some parts. We have already covered three of them, which is related to TDS. Second thing is that third point. Let's come to the third point. It says if you are showing any expense, which is income tax as an expense, if we are showing in your PL account income tax, a provision for income tax or penalty for income tax. This is specifically not allowed. This is specifically not allowed. Please tell me. Let's say. This is PL account of Mr. X. This is the previous year 23, 24. And here there are some expenses. Here there are some expenses on debit side to GST, whatever the amount is to custom, whatever the amount is, to income tax or provision for income tax or any penalty or income tax, right? This is not allowed under section 40 small a. Section 40 small a specifically says that if you are showing any expense which is related to income tax or provision for income tax, or any penalty, etc. of income tax, it is specifically disallowed. It is specifically disallowed. Sir, GST is allowed? Yes, GST is allowed. Indirect taxes are allowed. GST is allowed under section 37, we understand. Custom is allowed under section 37, we understand. Because GST and custom are not covered under section 32, 36. Remember that? Section 37. It is not covered under 32, 36. Is it a business expense? Yes, paying GST or custom is a business expense if it is related to your business. It is a capital expenditure. No, it's a revenue expenditure. It is prohibited by law. No, it is not prohibited by law. So if you are paying goods and services tax or if you are paying custom duty, it is allowed. There is no problem as such. It is allowed under section 37. But yes, subject to 43B. Because 43B, we understand, 43B has a list of expenses which says that these expenses are allowed. Some of the expenses which are mentioned in 43B, so there is a list of six or seven expenses. 43B says that these expenses can only be allowed if they are actually paid up to the due date of ROI, right? There is an amendment also related to MSME. I'll tell you that amendment also. But 43B says that there are a list of expenses which are allowed only if they are actually paid. And 43B has some expenses in its uh, list. And one of the expenses, any type of taxes, any type of taxes payable to government. So please tell me GST or custom duties are tax. So it is allowed, although it is allowed under section 37, but we have to also see whether it is paid or not paid. So if it is mentioned in your question, if it is mentioned in your question that it is not paid up to the due date of ROI, please disallow that GST also. It is disallowed because of 40 small a or due to 43b. It is disallowed because of 43b. Otherwise GST is allowed under section 37. But if it is not paid up to the due rate of ROI, then disallow it. Now you can again ask me, sir, if it is not mentioned whether it is not paid or not paid, tell me if for any expense it is not, there are so many expenses written over here. If the question is silent, whether they are paid or not paid, tell me what would be your assumption? What you will assume if any of the expenses are written, sir, we always assume that it would have been paid, right? So if nothing is mentioned, we always assume that it is paid. If Assessee has written some of the expenses in his PL account, and if it is nothing mentioned whether they are paid or not paid, we always assume generally that it is paid, right? But if it is specifically mentioned that it is not paid, then 43B will disallow this GST and custom duty. Again, coming back, GST and customs are allowed under Income Tax Act, we understand, but income tax provision for income tax or penalty under income tax is specifically disallowed under Section 40 small. 
Third point says the following expenses are specifically not allowed. Any income tax, provision for income tax, any surcharge or cess relating to income tax, any surcharge or cess relating to income tax, right? It is disallowed. Okay. Fifth point says that if you are contributing, if you are contributing to let's say provident fund or superannuation fund or any other welfare fund, we understand that it is allowed. If it is a recognized provident fund, it is allowed. So let's say this is the PL account of SSE. Let's say the company is Nestle Limited. Nestle, sorry. Nestle Limited's PL account. SSE is Nestle, let's say. And they have so many employees who are working for them. And Nestle contributes to employer contribution to let's say recognized provident fund recognized provident fund they are contributing let's, let's say 2 lakh rupees we understand that this is an allowable expense we have already covered in section 36 that employer contribution to provident fund is allowed right if it is a recognized it should not be unapproved it should be approved if it is approved then we can allow it again it is subject to 43b it is also subject to 43b do you remember that can you relate that there is a linkage between all of them it is all subject to 43b that you should, Nestle should deposit this amount in that fund up to the due date of ROI. Let's say it is deposited also. 43b is also uh, cause, causing no harm over here because it is deposited also. Section 40 small a is saying, section 40 small a is saying, see tell me, employer is contributing 2 lakh rupees. Every year employer contributes 2 lakh rupees. This 2 lakh rupees is depositing in a fund. This is a fund recognize provident fund okay let's say after employee retires or after employees uh, gives his resignation his or her resignation then they can withdraw this amount they can withdraw this amount also and we understand if in rpf we have already seen it in salary chapter also that if rpf is withdrawn before five years it becomes taxable although there are some exceptions if it is due to ill health or if he's transferring his rpf then it is not taxable but yes if they are withdrawing this RPF before five years, it will be taxable. So let's say they are, they are depositing. Nestle is depositing in this PF account and this is recognized. This is recognized. It is allowed, we understand, under section 36 also. And they have all, all, also, they are paying it timely before the due date of ROI. So 43B will also say, we are okay with it. We will allow it. Now here comes section 40 small a. 40 small a says, Nestle, it is your responsibility. Nestle, you have to make sure that whenever the employee will withdraw this amount, whenever the employee will withdraw this amount, and if this is taxable for employee, if this is taxable, when it could be taxable? If the employee is withdrawing it before five years, right? It, it will be taxable. If the, let's say it is uh, not falling, uh, here the case is not falling in those exceptions that ill health or uh, the company is shutting down. So it will be taxable to the employee. So Nestle has to make sure that there are sufficient arrangements made that whenever it is going to the uh, employees withdrawing this amount, this should be, if it is taxable, then TDS should be de deducted from here. So Nestle has to make arrangements that if whenever the amount will be withdrawn by the employee and if it is taxable, then TDS arrangement should be made. So 40 small is saying that please remember Nestle has to make sure that TDS arrangement has to be made and if TDS arrangements are not made 40 small a will say we will disallow it right and if you have made a proper TDS arrangements then TD uh, then you can allow this expense also. So this is 40 small a fifth point it says any contribution to provident fund or any other superannuation fund or any other welfare fund. Unless the effective arrangements are made by the assessee, here the assessee was Nestle. So here the assessee was Nestle. Unless effective arrangements are made, the TDS shall be deducted when payment is made from such fund. Whenever the amount will be withdrawn from such fund by the employee, and if it is taxable, Nestle has to make sure that TDS should be deducted on that amount, right? Last point, and if there are necessary arrangement made, we will say okay. But if there are no necessary arrangement made, then we will disallow it. So generally this point does not come in your examination. I have not seen this point uh, coming it uh, very often. In fact, I don't remember that any time this point is asked in your examination. But they, if 
it is mentioned specifically if it is mentioned specifically that nestle or any of the employer or any of the sec is contributing to such fund and if it is mentioned uh, in such a manner that they are mentioning that arrangements are not made for deducting tds then please disallow it then please disallow it. if nothing is mentioned please forget about this point we will assume that arrangements are made generally arrangements are made okay next is tax paid on non monetary perquisite tax paid on non monetary perquisite is not allowed to the sec we understand oh, what are non monetary perquisite because okay let me take this example only nestle has some employee uh, give me a moment let's let's say there is an employee mr sujoy he is working with nestle he is working with nestle and nestle pays him salary nestle pays him salary let's say in the year rupees 10 lakh so 10 lakh is salary for sujoy who will pay tax on the salary income so sujoy will pay because it's salary income for sujoy and this is an expense for nestle tell me is it allowed for nestle the answer is yes salary is allowed tell me which section section 37 it is allowed okay let's say nestle is also uh, uh, nestle has also given him a rent free accommodation they have also given him a rent free accommodation so he is getting rfa also and how nestle has got that accommodation let's say nestle has taken that accommodation or on rent and they have given it to sujoy okay so they are paying also rent of that house rent of building is that building is it used for business purpose the answer is yes because nestle has given this building to their employee so this building is getting used for business so they are but nestle is paying rent of the building some there there is some owner of that building there we have taken uh, it on rent and we are paying rent also let's say uh, the rent of that building is the that house is 25000 rupees per month so nestle is paying 3 lakh rupees also correct tell me now nestle is incurring 10 lakh rupees as salary and over and above they are also giving uh, him or they have also given him a rent free accommodation which they have taken in on rent 3 lakh rupees again nestle is incurring is this expense allowed the answer is yes it is allowed under section 30 rent of building and this building is getting used in business purpose tell me what impact it will make in sujoy's income sir we understand perquisite it will become a perquisite a taxable perquisite and he has to joy has to pay tax on 10 lakh also and on rfa whatever the value of rfa comes he has to pay tax also on that okay let's say the value is let's say let me assume the uh, we understand if it is taken on rent if it is taken by on rent by the employer we see that the value of perquisite is actual rent paid by the actual rent paid by the employer or rupees or 10% of salary, right? It is 15% or 10%. Now it is changed to 10%, right? A recent amendment over here. 10% of salary, whichever is lower. So we understand, let's say salary income is 10, let's say it is RFA salary. 10 lakh into 10% is 1 lakh. 1 lakh or rent paid by the employer is 3 lakh, whichever is lower, 1 lakh. So his perquisite of RFA will become 1 lakh, right? Now, initially, before this RFA, he was paying tax. So Joy was paying tax on 10 lakh. Now he has to pay tax on 11 lakh rupees, 10 lakh plus 1 lakh, 11 lakh rupees he has to pay tax. And due to which his tax will increase because he has to pay tax on this 1 lakh also. He has to pay tax on this 1 lakh also. Let's say he approaches his employer, Sujoy approaches Nestle and now Sujoy is requesting, sir, thank you so much. You have, you are paying me salary. You are paying me, uh, you are, you are also providing me RFA. Sir, but due to this RFA, my tax liability is increased. Due to this RFA, my tax liability is increased. So please, can you pay tax on this amount also? Can you pay tax on this amount also? Nestle will say, you are such a greedy person. Okay, we will pay you the tax on this amount because uh, you have to pay tax on 11 lakh, whatever your tax is related to this 1 lakh, we will pay it. So this we call it tax on non-monetary perquisite, non-monetary perquisite, which is paid by the employer. See, this is a perquisite and what type of perquisite is it? It is in kind that is called non-monetary perquisite. So because Joy has to pay some extra tax, why? Because now his income is getting increased due to this RFA value. 
So they are paying tax on non-watery percolators. So whatever the amount is, 40 small is saying no, it is not allowed. I understand it is an extra expense for Nestle. For this SSE, it's an extra expense. I do understand. It's a genuine expense. The answer is yes, it's a genuine expense. But 40 small a will say no, this tax on non-watery percolators, it is not allowed. Right, this not tax on non but monetary per it will not be allowed under section 40. Why it is not allowed? What is the logic behind it? We see that in our regular lecture, but as of now, you are doing revision. I think you have already able to recall why it is not allowed, right? So, these are uh, the section, uh, these are the points which are uh, there in section 40 small a. 40 small a is a very important section, okay? So, let us uh, just revise. It once again 40 small a if you are paying outside India or to a non-resident then TDS should be deducted otherwise we will disallow TDS will be deducted and deposited up to the due date of ROI other we will be disallowed otherwise we will be disallowing 100% of it if it is salary we will be disallowing 100% of it if it is paid outside India or to a non-resident and even if you are uh, depositing TDS on that salary which is paid outside India late it will never be allowed second thing is that if you are paying within India and on which TDS provisions are applicable and if you, you have not deducted TDS or if you have deducted the TDS during the previous year but not deposited the TDS up to the due date of ROI, we will disallow 30% of it, right? We will disallow 30% of it. Can it be allowed uh, later on also? Yes, it can be allowed whenever the TDS would be de deposited, it can be allowed. That 30% which you have disallowed, we can allow in that year, right? Tax on non monetary purchase, it is not allowed. Income tax expense, provision for income tax expense or any surcharge or penalty of income tax is not allowed, right? And if you have making contribution to any provident fund or any recognized provident fund, superannuation fund or any welfare fund, you have to make arrangements that whenever the amount will be withdrawn by that employee, the TDS provisions should apply over it, right? Okay. Now come to section 48.2. 48.2 say, say is, uh, says that about if you are making payment to your related party, if you are making payment to a related party, then over and above the fair market value, we will disallow that. Over and above the fair market value, we are going to disallow it. So it says that who is the related party? For individual, their relatives are related party. So for individual, their spouse, spouse, brother and sister, linear ascendant or descendant are the related party. What does linear ascendant or descendant means? Ascendant means parents or grandparents, descendant means children or grandchildren are related party. So if any individual is making a payment to spouse and let's say the fair mark, he is making a payment of rupees, let's say 2 lakh rupees, but the fair market value of that particular thing for which he is making a payment is just 1.5 lakh. Whatever the excess amount is, 50,000 will be disallowed, right? So for individual, the re his relatives or his, his or her relatives will be the related party. Who would be the related party for the partnership firm? Partners. So if partnership firm is making payment to partners, please, please make sure that it should not be more than the fair market value. If it is more, if it is less, we are okay with it. If it is more, then whatever the excess amount which you are paying, it will not be allowed, right? So for partnership firm, partners can be relative, including partners relative. So if a partnership firm is making a payment to Mr. A, who is a partner, Mr. A will be uh, will be uh, considered as a relative over here. And even if partnership firm is making a payment to Mr. A's wife or Mr. A's brother, right, or sister, linear descendant or descendant, to A's ch uh, child or son or daughter or to A's father or mother, in that case also. For them also, they are considered as related party. For AOPBOI, same thing. For partnership, we understand for partnership firm, the owners are partners. For AOPBOI, the owners are members. So if AOPBOI is making payment to member or any of the members, family member, they will be considered as relative. For company SSE, who is the related party? The shareholders? No, not all shareholders. Not all shareholders, only that shareholder who has substantial interest. Only that shareholder who has substantial interest. Because, see, uh, for company, let's say Reliance, it has so many shareholders. Even you might own some shares of Reliance. Let's say you own one share. You have today, you purchase, you have a DMAT account, let's say, and you purchase one share of Reliance. Will you be the owner of Reliance? The answer is yes, sir. We learn in our company law that shareholders are the owners of the company. Really? Practically, they are not actually. We understand company law says that um, 
or com company law also and otherwise also we understand that if you purchase a share because share is a unit in the company and you purchase a share you become a owner technically you become a owner technically but actually you are not the owner but actually in practical sense you are not the owner let's say you have one share no sir we are the shareholder we will become owner okay let's say you have one share you have purchased the share for rupees 500 now you are the reliance um, company shareholder okay so today you just walk into the reliance office let's say reliance office corporate office in mumbai you just walk into the reliance office and you will ask the peon open the door for me because i am the shareholder he will ask you sir how many shares do you have you will say i have one share what will Pian answer? Pian will answer that the person who is uh, a guard over there, he will answer, boss, please get aside. I have 100 shares, right? That Pian has 100 shares and you are just one. And that person is a guard, is a security guard at Reliance, right? So by purchasing just one share, we understand technically you become owner, you receive a share in profit that we call dividend, but how much related to one share? So all shareholders are not related. Only the person who has substantial interest, 20% or more ownership, that person becomes the real owner in that case. So here we understand that for company SAC, directors are related or directors relatives, director wife, director son can be related person, but not the shareholder. But yes, Mukesh Ambani can become a, a related person because why he is holding, he, although he's a director also, but he is holding more than a substantial interest, 20% or more share. So if individual for individual SAC, their relatives can be uh, the uh, related, uh, they're considered as considered as related party. Or even if let's say individual is making a payment to any concern where their relative has substantial interest. Let's say we are making a payment to a partnership firm where our spouse or my brother or the individual brother or sister has a substantial interest. Also, if they are making a payment to that particular, let's say, concern where their relative has substantial interest, that will also be called as relative. So any person who has substantial interest, 20% or more, that is also called as relative. So not for company, not all shareholders, only the person who has substantial interest, right? For partnership firm, it is all partners. Okay. So 40A2 is an easy section, but at the same time, important so whatever the payment which you are make you can can you make payment to your related party the answer is yes you can make payment to your relatives but it should be not above the fair market value if it is above in excess then whatever the expenses which you are incurred in excess of fair market value that will not be allowed next section is section 40a3 483 says that if you are making cash payment if you are making cash payment which is in excess of 10,000 rupees, that is more than 10,000 rupees if you are making a payment, that to a single party in a single day, in a single day to a single party, if you are making a payment of more than 10,000 rupees, then 40A3 will say that we are going to disallow this expense. We are going to disallow this expense. How much would be disallowed? Let's say if you are making a payment of 11,000 rupees, how much it will be disallowed? Entire 11,000. Is it in excess of 10,000? No entire 11,000 will be disallowed. So you should not make payment in cash, right? In cash, you should not make cash also includes here bearer check or cross check because cross check is, I'm not saying account pay check. I'm saying cross check because cross check is negotiable. You can, uh, you can transfer that check. So it doesn't, so we don't know uh, to whom you will transfer it. So we cannot track that particular payment. That is the reason they have said that if you are making a payment in cash or you are making a payment by bearer check or you are making a payment through cross check these all three are considered as good as cash so it will not be allowed so how you can make the payment you can make the payment by way of account pay check account paid bank draft nefd rtgs e-payment upi etc you can make the payment but not by way of cash if you want like to make a payment through cash you can pay maximum in a single day to a single party maximum ten thousand, not more than that right and yes, to the transporter for goods transporter, you can make this payment up to 35,000. 10,000 limit will be increased to 35,000. But we also understand that there are certain cases, certain, certain circumstances where you can make the payment of more than 10,000 also in cash, bearer check or cross check also. What are those cases that is important for us? Some of the cases are if you are making a payment to government, 
state government, central government, or to local authority. If you are making a payment to government or uh, to any R to any bank, including RBI, then you can make the payment of more than ten thousand also. Second thing, if you are making a payment for purchasing agriculture produce, if you are making a payment for purchasing agriculture produce, including meat, meat products, fish, fish products, etc., then also you can make the payment. But please remember, to whom you are making the payment, you are making the payment who is the manufacturer, who is the cultivator, who is the grower of that agriculture produce. That is, let's say if there is a restaurant, if there are restaurant, there is a restaurant in a city, and that restaurant is make is purchasing agriculture produce. That is vegetables. Vegetables are agriculture produce. But these agriculture produce, that restaurant is making a payment to a vegetable vendor. To a vegetable vendor. Tell me, is the vegetable vendor is the cultivator of that vegetable? The answer is no. He is a trader. That person is a trader. So, is it covered? Can I can we make a ma payment of more than ten thousand? No. To this person because he is not the grower, he is not the cultivator. So in that case, you cannot make the payment of more than ten thousand. If you are paying the uh, this amount to directly to that farmer who is the cultivator, who is the grower, the, who is the producer of this particular agriculture produce, then it is covered under this exception. To that farmer, to that grower, to that cultivator, you can make the payment of more than ten thousand, but not to others, right? So it is mentioned over here. Some of the exception where cash payment in excess of ten thousand is allowed, you can make the payment to government, RBI, or bank. You can make the payment to cultivator, producer, or grower, right? Not to other, not to traders. So if you are purchasing agriculture produce, fish or fish products, dairy or dairy, poultry farming, horticulture or apiculture, flowers, etc., then you can make the payment. But please remember, you have to make the payment to the cultivator, or we can say the producer, the grower. Similarly, if you are purchasing some handicraft goods, which are made without electricity which are where, where electricity is not used that we call without aid of power if you are purchasing anything which is um, manufactured without the electricity without the aid of power if you are making the payment to the person who has manufactured that right so if you are making the payment to the producer this point is important you can un underline this point producer you are making the payment then you can make the payment of more than 10000 but if you are making a payment to any trader for purchasing handicraft, that will not be covered under this particular exception. For that, only 10,000 is allowed. Next point is, if you are making a payment to any villager, that person is residing in such a village or uh, he has his business in such a place where banking facility is not available, in that case, you can make the payment. If you are make, making a payment to an employee or his legal heir on his retirement or resignation or death, of up to 50,000, it is allowed. Of up to 50,000, it is allowed at the time of retirement, resignation, or that. That is, they are leaving. Six point says if you are making a payment to an employee, that employee, you have sent that employee to some other city on some of on a business visit for a business purpose, you have or for official purpose, you have sent that employee in an, an, another city, and that too for more than 15 days or more. In that case, and if he, that employee does not have a bank account over there, in that case, you can make the payment. But practically, this point is not that relevant now because you, you understand now you have a centralized banking system. You can operate your account from anywhere around the country, even around the world also. And also, you have ATMs facility available. Even you can withdraw it from any of the other banks' ATMs also. Practically, this point is not that relevant, but still it is there in income tax. So if uh, you are making a payment to an employee who is temporarily posted to some other place for 15 days or more and where he does not have a bank account, you can make the payment. Seventh is, if you are making a payment, you are actually uh, making a payment by uh, uh, doing an accounting entry, by just making an accounting adjustment. In that case, it is allowed. Next is, if you are making a payment to any agent who purchased goods or services on principal behalf in cash. Let me explain this point. Let's say, Let's say, tell me, you can make a payment, not more than 10,000 is allowed, but if you would like to make a payment of 9,000 rupees to someone, you can do that? Okay. So I have, let's say, in front of me, I have 10 suppliers. I have 10 suppliers. I'm making a payment. I have 90,000 rupees cash in my pocket. I have 90,000 rupees cash in my pocket. I am paying to supplier number one, 9,000 today. As, and today also I have pay, making 9,000 payment to my second supplier, third supplier, fourth, fifth, sixth. To my all my 10 suppliers, I am making a payment of 9,000, 9,000, 9,000 in cash. 
allowed. Yes, sir. It is different parties. It is allowed. Okay. So I have 90,000 rupees. I have just made a payment of 90,000 rupees, but to different suppliers, it is allowed. Let's say today I'm not here. My agent will be dealing with the suppliers. So I have paid 90,000 cash to my agent so that he can make the payment to my suppliers. So if I am making the payment to my agent who will work on my behalf so that he can make 9,000, 9,000, 9,000 payment to my different suppliers, it is also allowed, right? Because ultimately my aim is to pay to my suppliers. So in between, if I am making a payment to my agent, so you will say, sir, it is more than 10,000. So it will be allowed. No, because here I am just transferring this cash to my agent so that he can make payment on my behalf. So this is mentioned over here, payment made to an agent who purchased goods or services on principal behalf in cash, it is allowed. Similarly, nine point says that if you would like to purchase foreign currency and if you are making a payment to a, a foreign currency authorized dealer, then you can make the payment of more than 10,000 also, right? Please remember if there is a bank holiday and if you are making a payment, it is omitted from here, it is not in this list. It is not in, uh, in this list. So if examiner will test you, they might confuse you. It's a bank holiday. No, on bank holiday also, you have to, you cannot make the payment of more than 10,000. Now it's been omitted. Okay. I think we can keep it right till here and we'll continue it in our next lecture. Although there are some other sections left also. Uh, we are, I have to discuss 43B and some small section 40A7 and 40A9. I'll discuss that in my next lecture. Till then, thank you so much. Bye and take care. And please keep on practicing MCQ also. They are uploaded on the website. Freely available. Go to MCQ section and start doing MCQ chapter wise. Till then, thank you so much. Bye and take care.